Welcome, beautiful people, and thank you for joining us on Till the Wheels Fall Off, a podcast by Two Folk Couple. I'm Matt. And I'm Paige. And we're here to inspire others, to bring you guys into our lives and tell you a little bit about our journey. Over 20 years together, we've learned a few things. We're going to work toward being the best version of yourself possible. We're going to dig into building a positive mindset, discuss mental health, addiction recovery, improving fitness, building businesses, and insight into what it takes to navigate life today. Welcome back. Welcome back. To another episode of Till the Wheels Fall Off. I'm Matt. I'm Paige. Today we're going to dive deep into the need for so many spouses and partners to understand this desire to understand addiction and the harmful behaviors behind addiction, whether it's addiction or narcissism or mental health issues, any number of mental health disorders, understanding why people act the way they do can sometimes feel like the key that's going to fix the relationship or at the very least make sense of the pain that you're feeling. But here's the catch. Understanding can bring clarity, but it can also keep you trapped. We're going to explore the emotional and psychological reasons why we crave understanding. We're going to discuss the benefits and the dangers of over intellectualizing the problem without taking action. But first, it's got some announcements. Yay. We've got a newsletter. Well, kind of. <laughs> I've had this newsletter now for, I don't know, like a few months, five, six months, yeah. and a lot of people aren't getting it. So I'm going to keep sending the newsletter, but I'm also going to post those as a blog on our website. So if you go to our website, www.twfo.com, scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, you can sign up for the newsletter. And I'm hoping that you get it. I think it's some kind of like email security server thing that's causing this issue. Yeah, I think so too. I really don't know. But at the very least, head over to the top of the page and you'll see a blog section. Click on the blogs and you'll be able to find it there as well. I will do my best to keep them updated every Monday, just like the newsletters. And you can also sign up for blog updates. So if you're not getting newsletter updates, at the very least, you can get blog updates. So you're going to keep doing both? Yeah, I'm going to keep doing both, I think. Okay. For the time being. Well, I might update the website and make the blog thing on the front. I'm going to see Okay. what that is. I'm not sure yet. Know. But we're just going to roll with it for now. We're just going to fly by the seat of our pants as we often do here. That's how we roll. (laughs) (laughs) We've got a course called Independently Strong. Independently Strong is a course designed for partners and spouses of alcoholics and addicts to empower you to make decisions from a place of confidence rather than fear. Many times people come to us and they feel completely lost. They are confused. They know that they used to be someone that they are no longer, and they wanted to rediscover rediscover who that person is. They want to stop enabling. They want to learn how to set boundaries. They want to learn the difference between enabling and helping somebody. They want to learn how to support someone. They want to learn what's true, what's false when it comes to addiction, and see through all the BS because there is so much confusion like we're going to discuss today. Yeah. Our our course cuts through all of that. Mm -hmm. We built it with the help of a licensed practitioner, Dr. Christopher Taylor, an LPC, that is going to walk you through a lot of these concepts as well. Each one of those modules, there are 10 of them, has a segment with Dr. Taylor as we discuss the material together to talk about you know, the, the, the research, the science behind all of this stuff. It is amazing. It is helpful. Right now, you are also getting 75% off using the code wheelies 75 That's wheelies with an S, 75. Yes, and it's a self-paced course. Yeah. So I just wanted everyone to know that. And also, once you finish the course, you can go back through it from a different perspective. And I'm finding some students doing that, and it's becoming even more helpful. It's kind of like steps, if you think about it. Yeah. You just keep redoing it, and you get a different perspective each time, which I think is really awesome. And I think that's cool that we put it out there like that, to where it's like, just because you're done, you're done, you're not done. You keep going, and we will add some new things there, here and there, too, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's awesome. If, if you only have time in the middle of the night, you are not limited by classroom hours. You can go on that thing whenever you want and knock some modules out, get some work done. There are exercises, there are worksheets, there's reflection, journaling prompts, you name it, it's all in there. Yep. And our our worksheets are, I know we've, I'm just going to discuss this really quick because our worksheets are very, they may, they're very thought provoking. They're simple, but they help you think about things in a different perspective. And I think that's what makes it different than a lot of programs out there. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's designed to, to make you think critically, to mm-hmm. really make you look at things in reality, 
to remove all the fluff that emotions create and to really look at this thing objectively and say, what is going on here in this relationship? What is going on in this particular situation? We Let's still have the relationship this. evaluation up. That is true. That is the mini course. We don't, we haven't been talking about that a lot, but if you want to get just an evaluation of your relationship, we have that um, on our website as well. And it's just the first module of the course. So if you're interested in getting that, grab it. And then if you like it, you can complete the whole course. You can grab the whole course. You can also split the course up into three separate payments as well. Yes. No interest or anything else. You can just pay right. three payments. Yep. Make it, trying to make this as affordable as possible for people. Um, next thing, we've got a community. Our community is called Tufo Community. It's a place where thousands of other people that are going through the very same thing that you're going through go to connect, go to empower each other. On Facebook. Yeah, it's on Facebook. Sorry, I didn't mention that. That's good. <laughs> it's a place I to connect. You. It's a place to, to, to have fellowship. It's a place to have a community. It's a place sometimes to vent. It's a place to share wins, to share progress, to share what you're doing, to be there for other people. As we've said before on the show, and I didn't make this up, I read this in Stephen Bartlett's book, that if you want to learn about something, read about it. If you want to understand something, write about it. You do that whenever you post, whenever you articulate your thoughts. And if you really want to master something, you teach it. You help other people through it. You show them what you did in your experience. And that's what we do in that community. It's a really, really helpful, empowering place. Yeah, we go live every Sunday evening as well. And we like to throw out weekly challenges for people. Yeah, we try to keep it active like we're in there like we're in there like and other amazing wheelies are in there it's a very active place it's awesome i don't know how many posts it gets a day but i would venture to say at least 100 mm -hmm. yeah right it's, it's probably like about usually right usually between 60 and 100 yeah it's great not too big that you get lost and not too small that like it's just crickets in there it's solid uh we've also got merch on our website we've got hats we've got stickers we've got rocks i think we've still got some sweatshirts up there don't <gasps> yes. we yes what was that? <laughs> I'm just trying to think. That's a maybe. I think we do. My head is going in a circle. I've, I've got to restock sweatshirts because it is sweatshirt season. Uh, and I think that's all I have. For, is that it? I feel like I'm missing something. I think you are missing something. Whatever. Let's just get this episode Okay, let's go. Road. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> do <all> it. good. <laughs> okay, so the topic of this episode came to me because we often get questions, especially on TikTok from people that ask these questions like, you know, when they do, when, when an addict does this, what, what do does they it mean? mean? Mm -hmm. What does it mean when they do X, Y, Z? What does it mean when this happens? If they sleep with someone else or they're talking to other girls, what does that mean? There's, there's this, this visceral desire to understand so much about what's going on inside of the mind of an addict, your loved one. Um, this, this is very common when it comes to narcissistic type behaviors as well. A lot of people want to understand why the narcissist does what he does. They want to understand where this is coming from. And it's always been kind of bizarre to us because we're so much about focusing on the behaviors rather than the substance or the disorder. Or addiction. Yeah. yeah or alcoholism. Like, it's like, all about what are the behaviors? Yeah. What, what are the behaviors? How do they affect you? Because I could answer your question, but it's going to get you no closer to a solution. As we will see as we go through this episode is that you can't fix this thing with simply understanding it. While knowledge is important, don't get me wrong, and there are benefits and we will talk about them, it is not the golden key. I think so often what people are trying to do without realizing is they think that if they could intellectualize this and they could understand why addicts do the things that we do, then you can find some kind of back door to approach it differently and in some ways help your loved one find a solution. Well, many of us are fixers. We're problem solvers. We want to be able to do whatever it takes to fix something. We think there's always going to be a solution to a problem. And we're like, well, what can we do? How do we figure this out? Who do, what do I need to do to make this work? But in reality, it takes two. It's not going to take just one person to fix it. Yeah, the person in addiction has the by far the larger obligation to make this right. Right, right. And typically the solution that you want is not necessarily what you need. Right, yeah, absolutely. I was sitting here drinking this great um, sparkling water. Waterloo. What the hell flavor is this? It's grape. It's not grape. But I just it's had purple. grapes the other day. It's purple. That's, you're right. That it's is purple. all. I love purple flavored it's stuff. Purple. They don't taste like <laughs> actual grapes. It's kind of like banana flavored things, like Laffy Taffy. There's a story behind that. Yeah, though. I know, but I'm not gonna. I don't want to talk about that right now. Do we have to talk about that right now? You've told me the story so many times, but you can tell the listeners if you want to. Go for it. Maybe you've talked about it. I'm before. not gonna bore anyone with my dad not, facts. It's I'm not just boring. gonna tell you that the flavor of bananas that you get from Laffy Taffy does come from an actual banana that we just don't use very much because I think it's prone to diseases. 
So we switched to different bananas, but those bananas still do exist and they taste like that apparently. Have you, oh, apparently. I've just never gotten like, my, my hands on them. They're, they're called, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's spelled G-R-O-S, like gross, gross, gross and then it's Michael, M I or Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L. I don't know how you pronounce it. I've just read it. Well, I love banana flavored taffy. I think the bananas that we eat are Cavendish bananas. And those are like the bananas that we eat most often. But maybe grapes have okay. the same story. Maybe purple it, is the okay, same well, story. Okay, well, now we need to go into some research mode after this and figure out why grape are, is not really tastes like grape. It tastes like purple. It kind of tastes like Robitussin sometimes. It's just it's, cherry flavored stuff tastes like Robitussin. But when I drink too. it, I just know that that's grape, but it's, it's not purple, grape. But it's not grape. No, but it's like blue raspberry. That's not, is that even, not that's not even a thing, is it? Like blue raspberry flavored stuff? Suckers? Ain't a blue raspberry just a blackberry? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> just trying to get tricky with these flavors, <laughs> trying to get kids to drink these stuff and uh, eat these suckers. Well, I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite flavors of sparkling water. I always love grape soda. I man. like it. So underrated. I agree. Okay, back to the topic. Sorry. Why do we seek to understand? Let's talk about that. Okay. Underneath a lot of this, there is the emotional need for control, validation, and closure. So when you're living in the chaos of addiction, in the chaos of a relationship where addiction is present, one of the first things you want is control because you lack all of it. And I don't just mean in the sense like you can't control someone else. I mean, you don't control anything. Right. Like it is a chaotic environment. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the fights that happen, like these... Hello, surprise kind of shit that happens every the single day. Coasters. The roller coaster of it all. Addiction creates unpredictability and understanding why someone acts the way they do can make the situation feel more manageable in a sense. Right. It feels more manageable the more that you understand. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. More than that, I think what it does is that it gives people hope that if you can locate the root cause, that you can solve the problem. If you can solve for X, then we can get this figured out. Mm -hmm. Did you have any experience with this? Like when I was acting the fool, did you ever think like, what is really going on with him? Is it his family of origin? Does he have some shit going on? Is it ADHD? Is it like... Well, yeah, I questioned some things. I didn't question addiction though. That was one of the things. We were just talking about this beforehand that I didn't really look into addiction for a long, long time mm -hmm. because I focused on the behaviors. Um, but yeah, there was some like, what if I, what, how do I communicate better? How do I um, talk to him? What can I say to him? What is it? Why is he treating me like this? Why is he still doing this? And I, I mean, I questioned it a lot, but I still really just focused on the behaviors more yeah. than anything. Yeah. So when it comes to control for many spouses, Understanding feels like a way to regain power in an uncontrollable situation. So just simply understanding the why of it all. Why do they do the things they do? Why do they text other women? Why do they disappear? Why do, why they, do they lie? lie? Why is their whole life a lie? Right. It, if you can understand it, if you could, if I could, if I could give you an explanation that, that you would buy, it would give you some kind of power over that over that situation because it just feels so uncontrollable. Like you need something to explain this. You think if I can just understand what's behind all of this, I can fix it. And that's, a, I think, a natural human instinct. 100%. Especially when you feel completely helpless. But mm -hmm. like you, you mentioned like women as fixers, caretakers, solvers. Like I think this is like, ugh, I don't know if it's ingrained in our culture, but I think that in a lot of ways it is where like women are looked at as like the, the, like, like the emotional heart of a home and the the fixers of all things when it comes to emotions and chaos and everything else like you manage a million crises on any given day exactly especially as being a mom if right think about just being having, a mom having to control your children and help like and there's a lot of teachers that do the same thing oh my god yeah so you think about that wheelies that are teachers they have to and have nurses a, and nurses they have to have a their job is managing environment chaos. and yeah. they have to be able to solve problems and they're really resilient too because they're able to fix things pretty quickly but when it comes to their most intimate relationship with somebody who struggles with addiction they have zero control and it makes them feel crazy so they ask a lot of questions trying to get more insight yes and i would like to know how many wheelies are math people Oh, like the math versus English brain? Yes. Like yes. left brain, right brain? Right, because like with math, there's always a solution, right? You you, you, you have to solve for the problem. There's always going to be something there. And for me, like math was always a thing. Like I, I love math. Math was a puzzle for me. And I knew that if 
I did X, Y, Z, I could get the answer. And I would put that within my relationships and other things and with my children and stuff. It's like, okay, well, if I can do this, I can make sure that things work out how I need them to work out. There's always a solution to the problem. Yeah, the, the bitch of addiction though is that even if I could tell you like how to solve for X, you can't solve for X. Mm. I have to solve for X. That. That's the that part right that there. sucks. Like, even exactly. If, even if I were to give you all of the information and somehow be able to write out exactly what is going on with your loved one mm -hmm. and tell you exactly why they do the things they do, that would just be knowledge. It wouldn't be anything that gets you any closer to a solution because the solution has to come from them. Right. So we'll get into some of this, this intellectual, oh my gosh, intellectualization. 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 That's a mouthful. I couldn't even say it. What the heck? Gosh. <laughs> okay. So for other people, this can also help them seek validation and closure. So it is validating in a lot of ways. Yes, it is. It is. Like oftentimes what we hear about our show Anytime I offer my perspective, people will say that's really validating because I've always thought this, but I've never heard it out loud from anyone who's ever been there before. And that's my role here at the end of the day is to provide insight and validation from the other side of addiction because spouses can talk about it, but I've been there. You know what you do? You help people trust their gut again. I hope so. You help I them trust hope so. their instincts by validating their experience because it's like, oh, he's you're calling the addicts out, which is what we have noticed and we recognize in those people, you know, in our partners, we recognize these things and you're like, yeah, you're on point. You're on point. So you're helping people trust their gut again. And that's a big, big deal. You guys are almost always right on the money and mm -hmm. so on point. And it's, it takes a lot of bravery to, to speak up and ask the question. And then when you hear it's exactly what you thought it was, it's like, oh my God, I'm not an idiot. Right. I can trust myself crazy. again. Yeah. That's my, that's my job here. That's what I'm, that's what I'm here for. It's a, it's a big, big job, but it, it can help lots and, of pressure <laughs> and, and trying to understand and asking all the why questions. It can help people in some sense. They're seeking validation, but sometimes they're seeking closure. Mm -hmm. So understanding whether your partner's harmful actions are intentional or they're driven by addiction makes a huge difference in how you see the relationship. If you believe that the behavior is due to addiction, you may feel more justified in staying. Because you can say, well, it's not really them, it's the addiction. And we'll get to this a little later. But you might think, if they didn't mean to hurt me, maybe I can forgive them. If it wasn't intentional, if it wasn't malicious, if it's not some like Machiavellian evil plan to hurt you, then it's easier to accept as, oh, people make mistakes, right? But in reality, the harm, the harm is, is happening regardless of the intent. Right. We had a whole episode on intentions. And, right. And the effects are real for you regardless yes. of the intent. Right. It's still going to affect you. Mm -hmm. Period. I just want people to know that. Yes. But it can be helpful for people. And this is why they try to understand it. This is part of the reason. This is sort of the mechanisms that drive the questions about why, why, why. Validation and sometimes closure for people. Because if you were to find out that these things were intentional, it'd be easier to say, well, I'm out then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you're right. Like, ceteris paribus, all things equal. If someone were to cheat on you drunk versus totally sober, would you be more likely to forgive the drunk person or the sober person? The drunk person. Right? Because you can look at that and there's so many variables at play now. Because you're blaming the substance. You're blaming the substance. You're, you're understanding Maybe that, it, the it, environment. that it, it, it affects the way that you make decisions and... and any number I, of things that can make you so do stupid shit, but it's, yeah, yeah, lowers your inhibitions, yeah, you know. But that's what I mean is that a lot of people look at the intent from that that angle, and that's right. why they ask the question. Uh, another thing behind all this is the alleviation of guilt and self blame. Many spouses believe that they're somehow responsible for their partner's addiction or their mental health struggles, and learning that addiction is a disease or that trauma drives certain behaviors can relieve the self-blame that comes with it. Like if you've been thinking, what could I have done differently? What can I do differently? How can I approach this differently? Learning about the nature of addiction helps you realize that this is not one of your failings. Yeah, that's big. Like what, what, what's the old Allen on adage? Like it's the three C's, right? You can't control it, can't cure it, and... You didn't cause it. Cause it. You didn't Thank cause you. it. Like that's the big one here. You didn't cause this. Like you're not causing this. You're not perpetuating this necessarily. It, Certainly we can, 
we'll get to this too about yeah, responses but, and whatnot. But hey, for the most part, you are not responsible. So it, it does help alleviate guilt and self blame. If people want to know more and more about addiction and why someone does the things they do and why they act the way they act, this is often behind it. Yeah, but a lot of the times they'll feel this way or they feel like. Um, it's their fault because they do have a partner who's blaming them for so much stuff. And that really does break my heart. Yeah. Those babies out there, man, guys that do that mm-hmm. make me sick. Um, this is one that you relate to. Yeah. Asking, am I the problem? Uh huh. A lot of times it's a discovery into how much of this, like kind of piggyback off the last one is how much of this am I responsible for spouses seek to understand addiction in an effort to figure out whether they are the cause of the dysfunction. So many people believe that they can learn enough about it. They'll discover that their behavior is contributing to the problem or causing the problem. So if you understand it, many spouses come to realize that much of the dysfunction stems from the addiction itself and not something that they are doing wrong. Yep. That's what you'll ultimately come to. But this is why. This is why. And the why is important. The the need for understanding isn't necessarily a bad thing in itself because it can foster empathy. It can reduce resentment. It can give you insight into someone else's struggles, why we do the things we do, why we do the stupid shit that we do. Mm -hmm. However, we've got to be careful (laughs) when understanding that this can be a substitute for action Yeah, oftentimes. So let's talk about when understanding becomes harmful. When asking the question, and trying to understand more about addiction, researching about narcissistic behaviors, because that is like the new thing on TikTok. Narc talk is huge. Yeah, There are thousands of creators that have hours of content that teach people about narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and the trauma that results from that. And they learn, and there's also very much like in the same vein, addiction, what talks about addiction. Oftentimes they are on a different side of this than us, where it's just like, explaining stuff away in an effort to like make this i don't know it it it, it, it relieves addicts of responsibility a lot of the time mm-hmm. i think we fall on the opposite side of the aisle when it comes to that yeah it's like you are responsible for the harm you cause i don't want to hear shit about the disease right. you have right you hurt people man yeah. it's not okay yeah. but anyway there is the what we're going to call the the trap of over intellectualizing things Understanding has limits, okay? Yes. When it becomes a form of emotional procrastination, it can keep you stuck. If you just sit there and focus on the why all day long, why, 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 why do they behave the way they do? What you're really doing, you are delaying action. You are delaying setting boundaries or taking meaningful steps to protect yourself. Because when I say that people ask the question, it's not like they ask a question and disappear and they just take the answer and just go live their life. Uh Oftentimes this is like a years long process for people. Yes, it is trying to understand, asking Mm -hmm. the questions. Why, 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 what is happening right now? Mm -hmm. As they're trying to get some sense of control again over this chaotic situation, but it can go too far. Yes, it can. It can go too far. Roll us through delaying action. You hate when I put you on the spot. I really do. She just went like this. <laughs> <laughs> I did a little bit. Like in the, you'll see me in the YouTube thing. Well, here's the thing. I was listening to you, and I was just trying to have a conversation with you. I'm talking too damn much. No, you're not. I had some stuff to say too. All right, I'll go. I don't want to. I don't want to. Re- Hang on. Let me drink some purple real quick. <laughs> no purple. You can't say that. That's like purple in your cup. Isn't that something that you? Oh drink? yeah, 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 man. Isn't that codeine? I like my Sprite Easter pink. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Was it pink or purple? Pink. The good stuff was pink. The crappy stuff was purple. She's referring to lean coating syrup. Yes. Yes. Cough syrup. Yeah. That's that was back. the Holy closest crap. I ever came to ODing was mixing lean with oxy. Like drinking lean all day and mixing oxy. Did you just take the pills and you were drinking the lean? Yeah. I took the pills throughout the day and I was drinking the lean sitting in bed at night. And Is that when you're breathing? Like breathing stopped. Crazy? Woke up like gasping for I air. wasn't home. Scared the shit out of me. I ended up snorting Adderall in the middle of the night to get my heart rate back up because that's how genius I am. <laughs> She's looking at me like I've got the lobsters crawling out of my ears. What's wrong with you? I forget that you were like... I was a street you pharmacist, were freaking man. freaking like... Psycho. Yes, you were. But I wasn't home that day. Yes, you were. You were in bed next to me. Was I asleep? Yeah. It was like... Did we... It was like three in the morning. Are you sure? Dead ass yes i remember this vividly i didn't pay attention to you too much back then i guess i don't know like i don't remember any of that stuff you were like doing your thing living your life like 
I don't care what you're doing, little child over there. I'm just going to live my life. Just don't treat I'm, me I'm like I'm a grown-ass woman. I'm not worried about your shit. Okay. Okay, understanding of when ex- when understanding can go too far. So delayed action. Instead of setting firm, firm boundaries, instead of, excuse me. Instead of protecting Sorry, your values. I had something in my throat. Instead of protecting your values, instead of living by your... That the things you cherish most, living yes. authentically, yes. you might keep researching addiction for years, months, weeks, whatever it might be, hoping to find the key that will magically fix everything. In reality, focusing on the why without acting on it is just going to lead to prolonged emotional harm because the harm is still happening, right? It doesn't stop. It is, it is static in the background. It's just happening nonstop. Right. And then... As you're researching and researching and researching and you're learning and, and it is an important process to go through, but yes. this stuff is still happening to you. Right. So I want to, I just, I'm going to interrupt you here because this is how my experience was, is that I did not know anything about addiction for a long time. I did not research addiction. I didn't even like look at, I knew that you had it in your family and I knew that and like you knew the, ba- I knew the basics of addiction, right? And I knew that. Oh, it's wrong. It's bad. I know that it causes issues and stuff like that. But with you, I never looked into it because I didn't, I didn't care. I was simplifying it by focusing on your behaviors Mm -hmm. because that's what was important to me. So I feel like if we overdo it and we overdo it and we overdo it, we're going to like completely lose ourselves in trying to figure out why it's happening. Paralysis by analysis. That's what this is often referred to. Really? Yeah, you get. Is that a thing? Yeah, you get frozen in this state of analyzing things, without taking any action. Like you can only learn about something so much before you need to go do it. Just go try it. Give it a shot. Like you can read about how to paint all day long. Does it help you make a painting? No. You can read about lifting weights. Does it help you get stronger? No. It's just information, right? Yeah. Neither good nor bad. It's just information. But spending time in a toxic environment where there's emotional or psychological abuse happening, and that's your life, that's your home, that's your day-to-day, you're getting nowhere just understanding more and more and more if you don't plan on doing something with that information. Okay. It's like never using your degree. Right. Never using the information that you're taking in. It's important to do something with this. You can get trapped in over-intellectualizing this stuff. Yeah. And just trying to understand the why, 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 why. Right. There's a lot of information about addiction out there. And I understand why it's like so overwhelming. It's it's daunting. Like there's so much information. And at one point in this country's history, or I think in the world's history, we looked at it, probably still some parts of the world that do this. It's just a moral failing, right? These are just weak people. These are weak-minded people. And some people still believe that, like fully. Like these are just weak people. And on the other side, you've got, you know, the the disease model of the addiction that says like this is anything but a moral fa- failing this is genetic this is societal factors this is the disease of the brain that causes this and so you spend a lot of time navigating what's going on i think without any information most of us think that addicts like if you didn't know if it was a disease people would just think they're just dumbasses these people are just weak they just have no self control they have no willpower whatever it might be And you spend so much time researching to understand about the disease model, but then you can go too far with that, right? Yeah, you got to find the balance in the in the middle. But this, like, learning takes takes time. Like, you have to sit and simmer with ideas for quite some time, and you can spend forever just thinking about this stuff and talking about it and researching it and watching TikTok videos on it and you name it, right? Yeah. Listening to podcasts, whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, all it's doing is delaying action and is keeping you in harm's way. And every bit of that emotional abuse lands somewhere and leaves scars. So consider that, that there is a price to be paid for this intellectual journey that you're on, Mm -hmm. that it come in the form of emotional scars. I just, it's, it's important. And there is an added complexity to this too, because if you're living with someone in active addiction, you get the stuff that we do. We are shitheads about this. We manipulate situations. We use addiction as an excuse for our bad behavior, which makes you question it even more. Uh We tug at your heartstrings because you love us so much. You want to understand us. You have seen us be good people. So you know, it's in there. So it's hard to tell what's what. We throw pity parties and say that this is so hard. You have no clue how difficult this is for me. We 
avoid taking responsibility. We also weaponize support. We did that on we an episode that. recently. Yep. Um, that if you were more, if you were more supportive, supportive, I wouldn't relapse or I wouldn't have trouble and we shift blame back onto you and that manipulation, it complicates things. Yes, right? it does. It makes the emotional landscape much more complicated than it otherwise would be. Yeah. It makes it harder for us to, to, to judge the behaviors that are going on yeah, and well, to see them for what they are. For sure. One of the other detriments to over intellectualizing this stuff and just trying to find out why, 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 why. Like I get a lot of emails, I get messages and DMs from people that are asking these types of questions. And on one hand, I want to validate you guys. And I, I do, but I know that there's a danger in answering messages because I know what you're also going to do with this information is you're going to use it to enable bad behavior. That's my biggest fear. Anytime I give someone an answer, I'm afraid it's going to be used to enable someone else's bad behavior. Unintentionally. Unintentionally, right. right, it's, right. Going to, it's going to be used to perpetuate the cycle of abuse. Like I feel like yes. I'm I'm like complicit in it sometimes. Yeah. Like I'm just giving the answer, but I know what, when someone's looking for it from a place of like compassion and understanding, it enables bad behavior. Sometimes understanding does lead to excusing bad behaviors. That's what I was going to say. You might tell yourself it's not them. It's the addiction, mm -hmm. depending on the question that's asked. Right. And that keeps you from holding people accountable. Yeah. It keeps you from focusing on the behaviors rather than the substance. But here's the truth. Understanding. Once again, understanding addiction doesn't change the fact that their behavior is hurting you. I did a TikTok over this and I got roasted, but in the comments by people, <laughs> Because that was that's that's my thesis at the end of the day is that the why is not as important as you might think. It's not. And everyone was like, no, the intent matters. Okay, let's let's keep going on that. Why does the intent matter so much to you? Kind of back to the cheating thing. If mm -hmm. if they were drunk, it doesn't mean as much. If they were sober, okay, you're excusing bad behaviors. Mm -hmm. This person harms you. True or false? Okay, that's true. So does the intent really matter if at the end of the day you're still in a therapist office dealing with it? Right. Does the intent matter that much to you? The only reason the intent would matter at that point is because you, you plan on sticking that. with it. Exactly. Because you can excuse the, excuse the behavior. Yeah. And I don't think every relationship is worth saving. I don't think everyone needs to be saved. I yeah. don't. Some of these things are long past the point of repair. And I get worried whenever people look for information to enable bad behavior. Yeah. Or to keep that cycle going because right. it's more comfortable. Yeah. Like it is, a, it is a concern of mine. I feel a responsibility to people saying this Agreed. that it is it's a concern of mine me too it is it, and like once again like the disease model of addiction adds complexity to this um it's a way for some to alleviate themselves of guilt they they can say things like it's not my fault i have a disease like, i've heard people say mm. that shit before it's not my fault i have a disease like okay you do have a disease sure yeah um it's treatable maybe it's not your fault but it is your responsibility, responsibility. to treat it yep. right yeah and not treating it is the same as not caring it's like that's negligence at that point mm -hmm. that's negligence so it's partly true but it just alleviates people the responsibility from their actions and that leads to enabling as the spouse excuses behaviors like lying manipulation gaslighting cheating thinking that the addiction absolves people of accountability right so i always worry when people ask me questions like did you mean to do these things? Like, did you mean to manipulate? Did you mean to lie? It's like, no, not always sometimes, but at the end of the day, does it matter? Right. You still did it. Like it messed you up. Right. Regardless. Right. It the broke lies, trust. It, it broke trust. Everything. Like it was awful and it really affected me. It doesn't matter if it was intentional or intentional or not. It went against my values and it was harming me. And you did it over and over again. Does, so... does the law care? No. If you get into an accident while drunk and you kill someone do they care no they don't man mm -hmm. like you're still getting arrested that right night. there's accountability you there. you will still spend some time in jail right like i didn't mean to do it but you did it someone's without their loved ones now does that make it okay because you didn't mean to do it someone's suffering now yeah. because of your actions it doesn't make it okay so i worry that people are trying to ask these questions that's what they're trying to do in some roundabout way Intellectualizing can also be a defense mechanism. For some, understanding becomes a way to avoid confronting their own pain. And this is kind of what we were just alluding to, is that by breaking down the addiction, by breaking down someone's behavior, intellectually, you protect yourself from feeling the full impact of betrayal or the full impact of disappointment. 
So instead of acknowledging your grief or your anger, you might spend hours analyzing their behavior, convincing yourself that understanding it will solve the problem. It keeps you in denial. It does. It keeps you stuck in denial. It keeps you stuck. Or at the very least being naive. Naive. Mm -hmm. Well, those are, those go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like you can, this, this can, you, you can over intellectualize this and cause harm and you keep yourself stuck for a very, very long time in trying to understand these things. Like our thing has always been separate the addiction from the behaviors and how those behaviors affect you at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Now there is, there is, there is validity to understanding addiction. There is validity to understanding what's going on with an addicted person. There is un- validity to understanding the why of it all to some degree. I just think it can go too far, right? Agreed. Like anything yes. needs balance. Absolutely. There's balance with anything. So like, I'm not saying don't research. I'm not saying don't ask questions. I'm not saying don't look into it or read or whatever, watch videos. It's just at the end of the day, it's still going to affect you. Like there is a price that's going to be paid from you mm-hmm. emotionally. Yeah psychologically it's going to affect you so when understanding becomes a substitute for setting boundaries or taking action what it's really doing it's enabling the addict's behavior a lot of the time and it's also keeping you trapped in a very healthy unhealthy, unhealthy dynamic. dynamic yeah yeah so the, like again the, the the key is finding balance between those things okay so i've sat here for the last like 10 minutes and i've ripped into Pages yawning, it's getting late. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've, I've ripped into like why it's bad to understand. But there are some benefits to understanding. But they come yeah. with caveats. Yeah. Which we will discuss. Mm-hmm. So first one, developing empathy and compassion. I don't think many of us need to develop more empathy and compassion <laughs> if we're being real here. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that because I agree. I agree. I, 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 uh, I know from our listeners specifically, maybe it's specific to our listeners because our listeners are the best. Uh, wheelies are amazing they are smart freaking people they get it they are very compassionate loving empathetic people i don't know if more empathy is the solution for you guys right like you don't have enough already right i think i think we need a little bit more f you attitude but still keep some of the empathy yeah just more balance just a little bit more balance right yeah more balance because if i know anything at all is that more and more and more empathy and more and more and more compassion isn't going to solve the problem but it is going to hurt much more when they betray you Mm -hmm. it's going to hurt a lot more because you gave up so much to that yeah you gave so much to understanding you went to meetings with them you went to counseling appointments and therapy appointments you sat down and you talked about what they learned in their counseling sessions or their iops or anything else because you actually effing care because you are amazing good people you are good people balance it put some of that into yourself man but let's just say let's just say that you are someone that is just like angry like you're pissed and like you don't believe in the disease model of addiction. This can help you develop empathy, compassion because addiction sucks, y'all. It sucks to live with. It's not fun. You don't necessarily want to hurt people. You just do. It drives selfish behaviors. It drives irresponsible behaviors. It keeps you in this perpetual state of Peter Pan, man child. And it's just... It's help, It's helpful to understand that it's not personal to you. It's not personal. There you that go. That it's not personal. But even then, I like to challenge that because it is personal because it is your most intimate partner. It's your the, the person that you decided to be with. So when they're treating you that way, it is kind of personal. But if you really look at it from the big picture, it's not you. Addiction is just, it's it's them. It's all them problem. It's not a you problem. Yeah. So if you're in the type of relationship where you feel like you do lack compassion or empathy or support this is this is important because you will understand that addiction does change brain chemistry and you might feel less personally hurt by a relapse or less personally hurt by any number of behaviors like it's not personal necessary this is just the shit that addicts do this is what addicts do. Right. You get more into the cynical wisdom phase right. in between there when you start realizing that. Yeah. And it, it could even help you. Like if you're new to this whole scene, it could help you and it could motivate you to, to help them seek recovery or professional help or treatment. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, I I heard that this is like a serious thing. Like you're not just... A, you, you're not just a, a, a horrible human. You do have something that is treatable. Uh, doesn't excuse these behaviors, but it's treatable. We can get you help. You know, it can help right. develop right. that. It, yeah, that's true. I just don't think our listeners are usually falling into this bucket of people. Um, for some, also set 
realistic expectations. Now, I want you to speak freely on this as I talk about it. Feel free to cut me off. So addiction recovery. <laughs> you want my opinions? Is that yeah, what you're saying? I, hell yeah, I do. Okay. So addiction recovery is not necessarily linear. Um, and what I mean by that is many people have setbacks in their recovery. Many people are going to have slips and relapses for periods of time. They're going to go in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And Mm-mm. to avoid the emotional roller coaster of disappointment, understanding and learning more about addiction can help you set realistic expectations. Going into it knowing that it's probably not going to be perfect. But you have to know what you're signing up for. You have to know that on the front end. You can't go into it thinking this is a perfect journey. Some yes. people get that experience. Yeah. I got that experience. Yeah. Well, kind of. If you were really were on the tape, I didn't because there were many because years. Because you were where relapsing over and over again. Trying to stop on my yeah, trying, trying to stop, stop my own. That's different. Like, but I really just, the whole relapse as part of recovery really throws me off. I don't like it. I understand that it's a thing and maybe my expectations are too high, but I know that every time that a person relapses, that trust, that rebuilding of trust starts all over again for the partner. Yeah, for the and partner it, for And sure. it might be a, a thing for addiction and maybe we need to understand that to some extent, but you need to have your boundaries in place too, to, to, know how many relapses you can have for your within your relationship yeah my experience has been working with other people and watching this from the outside is that relapses often it's it's not necessarily like a lack of commitment to the process as much as it is as it is like a a lack of understanding as to what's going on inside of your own mind it's it's a lack of self-awareness like many people feel like cravings make you use no you they they don't actually you make the choice to use Mm -hmm. your your irrational thoughts about cravings cause you to believe that if you didn't use something bad would happen to you or that you had to use to get through this event or that you didn't know what else to do like that's all bullshit it's bullshit we have options we have solutions you don't have to relapse you right, it's just that to. you haven't learned your coping mechanisms yet. Yeah, you haven't but learned how to go through your feelings from the beginning to the end. Everyone's patience for intolerance for this is different. Um, True, I'm just speaking on my experience and, and, and how I, I feel about it. Listen, I just want to say, like, I appreciate the fact that you have little to no fucking tolerance for this. I do. I appreciate that. I think that's admirable. I think that it helps me in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I got a little bit of like I, I don't know. Like, I think it's funny that. Um, David Goggins book can't hurt me is on a reading list Mm -hmm. because for people that have been through so much, like you read that book, you're like, God damn, these people are crazy. Oh yeah. But I think you all need, we all need a little bit of that in us. You don't need all that. Like that guy's a nut. Oh yeah. He's yeah, he is He's totally like he's extra. He's extreme, but I took a lot from that. You have to be able to access it. I got a lot of the, the not giving a fuck type of And like no fucking excuses. And no excuses. And the fact that, well, here's the thing too about relapse too, is that I'm going to recognize your behaviors before a substance anyway. And that's when I'm really, what I'm really going to look at. If you're going to, if you're starting to be an asshole again, or if you're going back down that road, if you're lying, that's a red flag for me. You know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do if, if that happens, if it happens over and over again, relapse. It's almost the same, right? The emotional relapse before the actual. Yeah. Event. And that, that's when I'm going to really question things. So relapse, relapse is just, I'm not going down that road again because I know what it means for us and what it means for you and what it means towards me. And I'm just not doing it. And so I can have that bow. I can have that value myself or that boundary in place to protect me and my children. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if you don't like it, I don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. I'm with you a hundred percent on that. I'm kind of, I don't know, tough when it comes to that shit, but yeah, a lot of people say relapse is part of recovery and it's just like, it's a, it's a really nice way for them to half-ass their effort or, or, like or to justify got, their half-ass effort. I think it's effort. gone too far. I think it's gone too far. Like, I understand that it can possibly happen. I get that, especially early on. Like, I know that it's hard and struggling is really difficult. But whenever they're always like putting it in your head that it's going to happen, I feel like it's there. You already know. Okay. It's just going to happen. I'm just going to relapse. Like you told me before you knew somebody who went out yep. from treatment, like one to two days and they yep. relapse and you're like, what, how, how, what do you mean? How did that happen? I've also known people in recovery that have told me before that they knew relapse as part of recovery. And so they looked at it like a meh kind of thing. Okay. And see, that's what I'm saying. You can't tell these type of people that because they're already manipulative they as weren't it is. At the, like, there's this dude I know and he wasn't serious about recovery at all at all he told everyone he was 
he's been sober for a while now, but he told me this like when he was going through relapse after relapse. He's like, I just didn't F and care. And it was a really convenient thing to say. It's just part of recovery. Yeah. He wasn't really trying. He didn't give a shit. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do, if that's part of your recovery journey, that's cool. But I'm not going to sit around for that because yeah. it's going to affect me. It will fuck me up because it will be betraying all over again. I'm not doing, I'm not, mm-mm. I just, I don't, that's another episode. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> so the first two beneficial, yeah, they can be, I think, just our person, our, like, our, our opinion is in certain circumstances, they could be for a particular type of person. But in general, I think the most useful one is that understanding, asking the why is it, that it reduces guilt and shame. Understanding addiction can help you release some of the guilt or shame that you might feel and not being able to fix somebody else. Yes. Understanding that addiction is extremely complex and it's not something that you get to control or cure. Recognizing that helps you focus on what, on what you can control. You can control, yes. right? Your own boundaries, your own healing, your own decisions, like yes. your own empowerment, your own life. That's what you can control. And that is probably the best thing that learning about addiction, narcissism, all those things can help you. That's like the best thing that you can learn from this. That. I think is the golden ticket of, of all. I, of I agree with that. I agree with that. And I think that that, and, but sometimes it's really hard. It's very hard whenever you finally realize this because you realize, I can't fix this on my own. Remember, we're problem solvers. Right. We're fixers. We're teachers. We're moms. We're nurses. We know how to work in chaotic environments. We know how to fix things. Make we know how to solve day. problems. But then when you start learning about this and you're like, I can't fix this. I can't solve this. It's kind of like, it. for me, it was a relief in a way. But I know how it can be almost... Hopeless feeling. Yes. Yes, exactly. Because you're like, oh my gosh, this is something I, I can't do. It means that they have to put effort into, like, there's nothing I can do to fix this. That's scary. It man. is scary. It's really, really scary. It's a really hopeless but and feeling. But I like feeling. to shift the perspective because this is where, like, my positivity comes in line is where I'm like, you know what? I think that this is an empowering piece because then you realize it's not yours to fix. It's the weight off of your shoulders. It's like, you know what? I can, I can control me. I can do what I need to do. I, they they, they got to fix their own thing. I can be there to support them whenever they're going through recovery and that's it. But controlling, no. Let it let it go. Yeah. Um, There's some other ones I had here. Hang on one second. I took so many notes on this. I know. Um, now we'll get to these in a minute. These are different. These are more on the topic of how it can be harmful. Okay, so... Having said all this, there are some benefits. There are some negative pieces of this thing, but ultimately what should we be focusing on? It's action. It's action over understanding. Boundaries over understanding. Understanding addiction can help. Don't get me wrong. We've just talked about that, but it won't protect you unless it's paired with boundaries. The, the knowledge alone is not going to get you very far in this deal. It's just not. Boundaries are what keep you emotionally and physically safe. Mm-hmm. They set clear expectations for what will and won't be tolerated. And they provide some some ground rules. They provide structure in some sense. And they provide a sense of accountability for everyone. For you. Yeah. In, in order to enforce them. Yeah. To get what you want out of life. To yeah. keep yourself safe. And also for the other person on the other side to let them know, like, this is unacceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do this shit anymore. So how to set effective boundaries? We've talked about this. We've got a boundary series that I hope you'll go listen to. It's a three-part series. We talk about the way the that values. we think is, yeah, the, the way that we set boundaries. The, we talk about values. We talk about like, what are you actually protecting at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Like, why, why do you have a boundary for this? Like, what's the behavior that's actually affecting you? Yep. Like, we, we go through it, right? And we have a boundary What's a good module. boundary? What's a bad boundary? Yeah, in the course, there's a boundaries module that walks you through this as well. So let's just say that you have a boundary on lying. Or being deceptive. Like, so just, honesty is one of your values. Yeah, honesty is one of your values. So you say, if you lie, if you're lying about something, I will not tolerate lies. If you lie, there will be consequences. And make sure to follow through on those consequences. And those consequences could be you remove yourself from the home, that you decide to end the relationship, that you move in with your mom, that you take a break in the relationship, whatever it might be. But you are not going to tolerate this. Yeah. That is focusing on the behavior, not just the addiction of the substance itself. Yep. And it's taking care of something that you have control over. Mm -hmm. This is an action that you can take to actually make a difference here. And they're not going to like it. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, no. They ain't going to like it. No, setting boundaries with, with, with 
addicts is very difficult. Yeah. And the reason this is important, like back to the behaviors versus this, the, the substance itself, like we are so big on that. I want to repeat it in every episode we have focus on the behaviors. Stop focusing on the substance because your partner, guys like me are going to claim that the addiction made me lie. It was the addiction. You have no idea what how hard this is, what this is like, but boundaries remind us that no matter the cause, the behavior is unacceptable mm-hmm. period. End of story. The end. Finn. That's it. That's all there is to it. What'd you just say? Finn. Oh. At the end of like old French silent films. If I end. Oh, I learned something new too. You don't remember that in like old cartoons? No. I learned this shit from like Looney Tunes. No. You remember that? Yeah. Oh, that's cute. Drugs didn't ruin everything in my brain. <laughs> 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 okay. Um Setting clear expectations. So we can all, we, have, we talked about weaponizing support. I think it's important here too. This is another action. So setting clear expectations that support from you is conditional. If a partner tries to manipulate you into feeling like you're responsible for their recovery or uses your support to avoid accountability, you need to disengage. Yeah. If they say shit like, if you were more supportive. I'd stop drinking. I'd stop drinking. I quit using. I just need your help. I just need, you don't have no clue how hard this is. I just need your support. I can't do this without you. I wouldn't Rem- lie to you if you nag- if you didn't stop nagging at me. Right. You Remind them that. what you learned when you were researching all this shit. And that addiction recovery is their responsibility at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Your support isn't there to carry their burden. It's to stand by them when they're doing the work. Support people in recovery, not an addiction. addiction. Let's normalize that. Everyone wants to normalize shit these days. Yes. Let's normalize that one. Yes. Let's normalize supporting people in recovery, not an addiction. Yes. You can't claim support when you're not doing anything that actually requires support. You just want me to be okay with my lack of fucking effort. Ooh, That's I all it is. I love that. That one, look, it's under my skin, dude. Okay, so yeah, ba- boundaries are going to help you balance this. We talked about the, the need for balance and all this. Boundaries are going to help you understand the balance and understanding and action. So we talked about the understanding piece. This is the action piece. You can empathize with someone's struggles. We want you to do that, but it doesn't mean you have to tolerate behavior that harms you. Two thoughts at once. Always. Setting boundaries allows you to protect your well-being while supporting healthy steps forward for them as well. Okay, reducing guilt and moving forward. This is another piece of it that's important. Mm -hmm. We talked about this a little bit. Reducing guilt and moving forward. So letting go of unnecessary guilt. Addiction can help you release, or understanding addiction, sorry. (laughs) Understanding addiction (laughs) can help you release some of the guilt that you might feel, the shame you might feel for not being able to fix people. Again, it's complex. It's not something you get to control. It's not something you get to cure. Recognizing that helps you focus on what you can control, returning the power to you, returning the focus to you. This is like what our course does. Yep. This is what Independently Strong is designed to do. Yep. Instead of blaming yourself from relapses or anything else, you get to return that power to you. What do I need? So kind of back to the beginning when I'm like wondering, like, what are people really getting at when they're asking the question? They're trying to avoid this piece of it, which is that you have to focus on yourself. Yep. Understanding addiction is important, but what's more important is that you're moving forward and it reduces the guilt in doing that. This is how I think you use this right. This is a power you can use rightly. It should reduce the guilt that you have for not being able to fix someone. And it should help also move, let allow you to move forward and take action and empower yourself with education, which is part of it. That's part of the Veer method that we use. Uh We validate people and Uh then we educate them. And this is part of that. Yes. But then we empower people and then they recover. Like half of the process is literally action. Yeah. You know, the first piece, we just listen to you, tell you you're not crazy. Mm -hmm. We hear you and we educate you. Then we empower you and you take action and you recover and you do amazing things. You live an amazing life. And it's, if it does anything at all, this is gonna help you make informed decisions. Yeah, for sure. Like that's what we try to accomplish as well is that at the end of this, at the end of the process, all of this, everything that you learn, listening to our show, working to the course, whatever you might do, listen to other creators, other podcasts. At the end of the day, we want people making informed decisions from a place of confidence, un- confidence rather than fear. Yeah. 
just be, you're not going to make decisions just because you're not going to make decisions out of just fear of the unknown or fear of what you won't get or fear that you won't have your happily ever after or fear that your marriage is ending. You'll be making decisions from a place of confidence because you will know that no matter what happens, you are going to be okay. I promise you that. Yes. I promise you that. There's just, I've never seen it work any other way. Right. I haven't. I've never seen someone get out of one of these things and be like, that's the worst decision I ever made. Seriously. Have you ever heard that? No. I've heard people heartbroken. Right. I've heard people sad when they think back oh, on it, but I've never heard someone say like, that was the worst decision I ever made. No. Not one time. Mm-mm. But I've heard a lot of people say, I wish I'd have made this decision about 20 years ago. Oh yeah. We see that a lot. Because I spent a long time trying to understand this stuff. Mm-hmm. And addiction adds so much complexity to all this and the things that we do to tug on people's heartstrings and yeah, sometimes we show you a little bit and you think that, oh, they're getting it and then we don't get it. Um, a couple other things. These are a couple notes I've made. Something else that I think people do whenever they're trying to understand is there's this like underlying hope for change. When spouses and partners are trying to understand what's driving the harmful behavior, I think what they're doing in some ways is they're holding on to the hope that change is possible. Mm-hmm. It's like if you can explain to me the mechanism that's causing this, that means it can be fixed at which point I can have hope again. Right. You know? Right. And a lot of times you get stuck in the hope trap. Yeah. And that goes along with thinking that if you remove the substance, then everything will be okay. And that's not necessarily true. No, it's not. This is from um, similar to Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I think that there is a lot of benefit in the search for meaning and suffering. I was thinking about this when people ask the question, a lot of times they've been beat down figurative, figuratively and literally sometimes mm-hmm. yeah. just completely wrecked, you know, compared to the person that they were when they entered the relationship. And for many people suffering without some kind of explanation or purpose just feels absolutely unbearable. Like if, if they can understand why someone behaves the way they do, it makes the pain feel purposeful in some way. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yeah. I was kind of making notes. and I think this is sort of behind some of this stuff. Right. Um, they might believe that by gaining insight, they can make sense of their suffering and then give it meaning. If it has meaning, then it has purpose and it can be reused. It can be, you, you can use alchemy. You can create yeah. whatever you want from it. But right. in understanding it, some people are trying to do that, I think. But the one that I worry about the most is that people rationalize trying to stay in an abusive situation that is no longer tenable for them, for their children, for their emo- emotional or mental health. It's just not. This is, this is a dangerous situation sometimes. And if you're using, when, when you've invested years and years in a relationship, like we talked about the sunk cost fallacy, how this is just a natural human reaction. Like when you've invested a lot of time and a lot of effort into something, the tendency is to stick with it rather than to give up on it because you invested time. You've got a lot of resources invested in that person or that thing. You know, this, this is a business term as much as it is a relationship term. But a lot of times when people have invested years and years and years, they might feel that leaving without fully understanding would just be a waste. Yeah. And I, I get that because we do encourage people to turn over every stone. Right. For like, sure. Turn over every stone. And yes. the reason we encourage it because we know that you won't take action until you have anyway. Mm -hmm. So turn over every stone, try everything, look at everything, try that treatment center, try that program, try 10 different methods, whatever it might be, but you're not going to make a decision until you've done all those things. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of time when they're researching this stuff is what they're trying to do is trying to understand stuff so they can rationalize at the end of the day, what they're really doing is rationalizing, staying with it. If they can find more answers then there could be another solution in which case, they're going to stick around. But my thing is, once again, it's, does it matter? Does right. it really matter? If right. you the know what the solution looks like. The still impacting you. They're still are impacting you. I think that's the, the part that breaks my heart for people is that every day that you stick around a situation like that has a worse outcome for you mm-hmm. and for your children. And it's going to be repair that you have to do at some point. At some point, you're going to have to pay the piper. Yeah. And that that's just the reality of it. Like That's the reality. So when you're thinking about narcissism and addiction and all these things and bipolar disorder and a lot of these things that come up in our space, I just want you to know that you can learn all you want about them, but at some point it's going to have to be followed by action. You can paralyze yourself analyzing this stuff for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And it's 
going to result in you sticking around a situation for longer than you probably should. Right. That's just the, those are the facts. That's the reality. Yeah. Like Dr. Clark cracks me up because this dude is bold. Yeah, he is. He will straight tell people like yeah. they'll be with a narcissist and he'll be like, you need to get the hell away from that person yeah. as fast as you can. Yeah. He'll tell them that we need to build you up. I know that you may not be able to leave now, but you need to get out because they are not going to change. He is very blunt and very direct. And I appreciate that because he's, he's pretty much on point. Yeah. You know, with addiction, it's not too dissimilar because we're not just dealing with addiction. If it was just that simple, it wouldn't be so painful. Mm. It's the abuse that comes with it. Oftentimes yep. it's the abuse. It's the abusive piece of this thing that makes it so much more dangerous and why we take it so seriously. The behaviors. It's the behaviors that harm you, right? That's the stuff. That's the stuff that hurts. Like, I'm sure that there are certain types of addicts out there that are just like golden retriever energy. Just chill. Just chill. And they're not out there to hurt anybody. Okay, but and they're just lovable. There's no way that they're they... harming themselves. And certainly they'd be harming finances. And certainly they wouldn't be a full equal partner. That's what I was going to say. They wouldn't be available emotionally they're not fully. They're emotionally available. You can't depend on them to pick up your children if there's an emergency. You know, because they'll be messed up. No, that's that's still affecting you. Yeah, it's still going to affect you. It may not be. I mean, they have to. They may be lying at a certain extent. It's going to affect your trust, right? But it's 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 harder to look at that one and be like, how can you give up on that? Well, at some point, you're going to have to weigh the pros and the cons of this. Well, and thing. it's progressive. So you're right about that too. It is progressive. Like what you see now is probably not how it's going to look for a while like functional alcoholic always drove me nuts that was like one of the first reels we ever did that like actually got traction mm -hmm. talking about functional alcoholism and it's like that's not a type of alcoholic that's a stage that we pass through on the way to misery most of the time yeah some people stay there for a very long time but it it gets us all yeah. eventually it gets us all yeah and someone's always got some story about their grandfather. Everyone's got this grandfather, it seems like. Yep. My grandfather drank four whiskeys every single night, and he smoked cigarettes to the day he died at 90. I'm like, yeah, and I bet your grandmother was effing miserable. Yep. You ever talked to her about what she really thought? Exactly. She might have been from the Depression era, so she didn't expect much of a husband, but is that a marriage that you would want? Right. Like, we can convince ourselves that these people are so awesome and functional. Bullshit. I agree. Bullshit. You can't convince me that's the truth. No. You can't consume that many substances on any given day and be there for your wife and kids. Yeah. You just can't. No. And for yourself either. You just can't. But everyone's got that grandfather. You've heard that story from Oh, people, yeah, right? I have. <laughs> I've yeah. heard it multiple times. So many people have got that grandparent. <gasps> yep. Yeah, he did it till the day he died. And they use it as like a justification, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, I actually was talking to a guy this Saturday about it. He's like, you know, for the longest time, I just justified the way I drank because my great-grandfather did it, my grandfather did it, my dad did it. I'm like, yeah, you are come from a very long, proud family of alcoholics, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> You broke the cycle, though. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Dude's been sober over a year, man. He's awesome. He's doing great. He's loving life. He's there for people, and he's, he's productive again. You don't realize how much you're giving up and how much you're sacrificing. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The grandfather story is crock of shit. Yep. All right. It's getting late. I'm out of purple drink. Purple drink. Purple drink. Yep. That isn't a lot of rap songs, actually. All right. Let's wrap it up. Okay. All right. Until next time, I am Matt. I am Paige. And we'll see you. Bye.